crime and court. My name is Heather and this is episode 22, 23, (laughs) unsealed court docs motion to dismiss charges. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing is reading through the motion, the defendant's motion to dismiss the charges. And as you can see on the screen, um, just in case everybody just got the same bald head, but except for Colin, he's got hair still apparently. And John, maybe, maybe that's a wig. I don't know. Wouldn't that be funny if she was bald too, like everybody else under that. Anyways, so um, on your furthest to the left is Trooper Proctor. Then you got Gemma Cabe. Then you got, I think that's Chris Albert. And up top is Colin Albert and then Brian Albert. That's correct. So um, just in case you were wondering who all of these individuals are, they are witnesses or liars. I don't know. One or the other. That's what we're going to get into today. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the motion or we're going to read through the motion. To- we're going to read through the motion to dismiss. So basically what happened was this was filed under seal or, you know, it was impounded as they call it. So basically it was not for public consumption to read. However, the um, Boston Globe filed a motion to unimpound the this document so we're going to read it that and she obviously so ordered the documents in exhibit a are no longer impounded and shall be available for public inspection and so ordered boston globe is the person okay so this exhibit a is defendant's motion to dismiss indictments and memorandum in support thereof it's going to get good. And I just want to warn you, too, that this is a very long document. It might turn into multiple parts on my end. I really want to try to get it in one. But if I do two parts, I will do a double feature so you have them back to back. So you don't have to wait because I really want to get this one out because this is a good one. So and because trial starting April 16th. If you don't know, we are talking about the Canton cover-up, Karen Reed, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, and this is Karen Reed's motion to dismiss the charges, and uh, we'll see what happens. So basically, their motion to dismiss is because the integrity, the reason for this motion is because the defendant states the integrity of the grand jury proceedings was impaired by an unfair and misleading presentation to the grand jury, which requires dismissal of the indictments. We're going to skip through the statements of, well, we're going to skip through this first period. We know Karen Reed is charged with the unaliving of her Boston police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe, who ended up on the front lawn of another Boston police officer's home, Brian Albert, who we were just looking at in the thumbnail. So he was found unresponsive approximately 6 a.m. on January 29th, 2022 in the front yard of Brian Albert. Over the course of 14 days, the Commonwealth presented the testimony of 41 witnesses to the grand jury. The Commonwealth called law enforcement officers from the Canton Police Department who responded to the crime scene just after 6 a.m. on January 20th, 29th. Officer Stephen Seraph, Sergeant Sean Good, Officer Stephen Mullaney, and Detective Sergeant Michael Blank, responding EMTs, paramedics, and members of the Canton Fire Department, including Anthony Flamatti, Timothy Noodle, uh, Katie McLaughlin, Matthew Kelly, Francis Walsh, Jason Becker, Daniel Whitley, and Greg Woodbury. Massachusetts State Police. Troopers Michael Proctor, Kathleen Prince, and Yuri Buchanik, and David DeSicchio, the individuals who testified they were present when Ms. Reed, with Miss Reed and Mr. O'Keefe at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on the evening of the 28th when everybody said they were all in love and fine and good and everybody was having a good time and Cameron didn't look like she drank too much, she didn't look intoxicated, that's what everybody says. But apparently she was so intoxicated that she 
in a fit of rage, ran over her boyfriend and didn't remember it. <sighs> okay. Um, anyways. So including the, those people that were with John and Karen at the waterfall included Chris Albert, Julie Albert, Karina and Nicholas K. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Nicole Albert, Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, a percipient witness who observed Ms. Reed drop O'Keefe off at the Albert residence just after midnight on January 29th. Ryan Nagel, friends and family members of the decedent, Aaron O'Keefe, Paul O'Keefe, Catherine Camerano, Michael Camerano, Laura S Sullivan, Mar Marietta Sullivan, Christopher Curran, Carrie Curran, none of whom witnessed any of the events that transpired on January 28th. MSP Lieutenant O'Hara and MSP Detective Brian, uh, Lieutenant Brian Tully, who testified that his team recovered a sneaker and several pieces of clear and red glass consistent with pieces of taillight from 34 Fairview Road at 6 p.m. on January 29th. Forensic pathologist Irene Scordabello, who testified regarding O'Keefe's injuries, Kurt Bra Roberts and Carrie Roberts, who were informed just before 5 a.m. on January 29th that O'Keefe was missing, Nicholas Roberts, a forensic scientist with the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab, and MSP Trooper Joseph Paul with the Collision Analysis and Reconstruction Section. A majority of the witnesses who testified before the grand jury were not percipient witnesses. Percipient just means that you observed it with your own senses. So in case you're wondering what that means. So Ryan Nagel observed with his own senses that Karen was sitting in her car by herself, no John anywhere in sight on the ground or otherwise. And Karen was sitting in her car with her hands 10 and 2 on the wheel and just stuck staring straight ahead that's a percipient witness because he saw that with his own eyes he experienced it with his own senses somebody who would not be a witness would be um trooper proctor who was not there that night for example okay so got that clear um, a majority of the witnesses who testified before the grand jury were not percipient witnesses to any of the events in question and were instead called for the purpose of testifying to remote and irrelevant bad character and propensity evidence prejudicing the jury against Ms. Reed, misleading the grand jury, confusing the issues, and wasting time. To be clear, not a single witness testified that they observed Ms. Reed strike O'Keefe with her vehicle, injure him in any way, or otherwise drive erratically on the night in question. <sighs> That's good. The Commonwealth's presentation of the case was predicted, predicated entirely on flimsy speculation and presumption underpinned by a questionable and, and biased investigation and highly dubious physical evidence. This is very well written. Was this... I'm sure it was Andrew Jackson or Alan Jackson. I mean, not Andrew Jackson, <laughs> not the president, founding father, whatever. All right. So absent the abject fraud perpetrated on the jury by the Commonwealth and its agents, Sergeant Link and Trooper Michael Proctor and the repeated reckless admission of in inadmissible, highly prejudicial and irrelevant information, the grand jury never would have indicted Ms. Reed in this case if they knew Trooper Proctor and Michael Link and them were all just buddy-buddy friends with the Alberts. Um, maybe they would have thought differently about the case, those jurors. Given the sheer volume of the grand jury transcripts in this case, the facts underpinning the respective arguments are set forth in more detail in the respective argument section below. So they're taking apart pieces of the grand jury testimony, but just like the main points, not all of it. 
All right, so the evidence presented at the grand jury established that on the evening of January 28, 2022, the decedent John O'Keefe and his girlfriend Karen Reed met and enjoyed drinks with a group of individuals at the Waterfall Bar in Canton, Brian and Nicole Albert, Jennifer and Matt McCabe, Chris and Julie Albert, Brian Higgins, a close friend of Brian Albert, and a special agent with the um, Massachusetts Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, an ATF agent, with an office inside the Canton Police Department. So he works in very close, not just close proximity, he works like in the same building with the Al- uh, Kevin Albert and um, Kevin Albert's the brother of Brian, who is a Canton police officer. So yeah, him and Brian Higgins and Kevin Albert would probably know each other pretty well for working in the same office and whatnot, plus being friends with Brian. And I don't know. And then the the uh, Karina and Nicholas K. Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Jennifer McKay, Matt McCabe, Chris Albert, and Julie Albert and are all members of the same family. Jennifer McCabe and Nicole Albert are sisters. Chris Albert and Brian Albert are brothers. Got it? Okay, good. All of the witnesses who testified before the grand jury indicated that Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe appeared happy at the bar and were in good spirits. As the bar was set to close around midnight, the parties discussed going to Brian and Nicole Albert's residence located at 34 Fairview Road, the Albert residence, to celebrate their son Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday. But Brian Albert Jr. wasn't with them at the bar. He was still back at the house. He had friends over. And not only friends, but his cousins, Colin and Caitlin. Shortly after midnight, Brian and Nicole Albert, Jennifer and Matthew McCabe, and Brian Higgins left the bar in their respective cars and drove to the Albert residence. Brian Albert Jr. was already at the house with two of his friends, Julie Nagel and an unidentified female. According to Brian and Nicole Albert's testimony before the grand jury, Their nephew, Colin Albert, was also present for at least part of the party. Video surveillance footage and witness statements confirm Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe left the waterfall around midnight and departed together toward the Albert residence in Ms. Reed's black Lexus SUV. Text messages and call detail records from Ms. McCabe and Mr. O'Keefe conclusively establish the following timeline. 12.14 12.14 a.m., Ms. McCabe texts Mr. O'Keefe, where to? At 12.14, Ms. McCabe calls Mr. O'Keefe, and they discuss the throng. I believe it was Mr. O'Keefe texted. Uh, that's why I paused for a second. It was actually John who texted McCabe, where to? And then Jen called O'Keefe. I see, I know this case very detailed so that threw me off but that's incorrect so it uh first one should be mr o'keefe texts jennifer mccabe asking where to ms mccabe then calls mr o'keefe and they discuss directions to the residents at 12 18 mr o'keefe calls ms mccabe back wanting more specific uh instructions to get to the house at 12.27 a.m., Ms. McCabe texts Mr. O'Keefe, here, question mark. At 12.20, like by that time, he should have been there. And at 12.29 a.m., Mr. O'Keefe answers a call from Ms. McCabe, which is interesting. At 12.31, Ms. McCabe texts Mr. O'Keefe, pull behind me. 12.40, Ms. McCabe texts Mr. O'Keefe, hello. 12.42, Ms. McCabe texts Mr. O'Keefe, where are you? And then she texts him hello at 1245. Excerpts from Jennifer McCabe's and John O'Keefe's cell phone extractions are attached. Labeled Exhibit 6. All right, so multiple witnesses testified that they saw a black SUV pull up to the Albert residence at 34 Fairview Road at approximately 1215 a.m. At around 1230 a.m., Ms. McCabe claims to have observed a black SUV pull up outside the Fairview residence with the passenger's side of the vehicle facing the house. According to Ms. McCabe, although the vehicle sat outside the residence for approximately 15 minutes, no person ever came inside. Ms. McCabe testified that he 
Mr. McCabe testified that he observed tire tracks in a V-shape consistent with a three-point turn in the area where the dark SUV had previously parked outside the house. First, their first theory was that it was a three-point turn and um, she hit him while she was backing up. And then people realized somebody, not people, somebody did a video on YouTube and basically showed us how that theory did not line up because if she would have hit him, it would have been the opposite taillight if she were doing a three point turn. So there went their theory there because the taillight has to be part of it. The taillight is a key piece of it. So they realized that they had to change their story. So they backtracked and then it, they made it so that she was reversing at like 20 miles an hour to get to him, which makes no sense. Okay, so Ryan Nagel testified that he arrived at the Albert residence around 12.15 a.m. at approximately the same time as Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe. Ryan Nagel testified before the grand jury that he received a text from his sister, Julie Nagel, around 12 a.m., requesting that he pick her up at Brian Albert Jr.'s house, a longtime friend of 15 years. According to Mr. Nagel, he and his friend and girlfriend arrived approximately 15 minutes later, so 12.15, to pick up his sister, Julie. As they drove from Dedham down Cedar Crest to take a left on Fairview Road, he observed a dark SUV coming towards them from the opposite direction, preparing to take a right onto Fairview Road. They followed the dark SUV towards the resident's uh, towards the Fairview residence. Once there, Mr. Nagel and his friends parked their Ford F-150 directly in front of the driveway, such that the passenger side of the vehicle was adjacent to the entrance. So if he w got out of the car, he would be facing the house and, and um, the passenger would be facing the house in on the driveway. All right, so Mr. Nagel testified that the dark SUV was parked in front of their vehicle facing the same direction. Mr. Nagel testified his sister, or texted his sister, sorry, Mr. Nagel texted his sister to let her know that he had arrived. Sometime thereafter, Julie Nagel came outside to greet them. She said that she wanted to stay a while longer and would most likely spend the night at 34 Fairview Road. But then an hour and a half later, she gets dri driven home by somebody. So it's, her whole story is changing. It is odd. Very odd. Um, so she said that she wanted to stay a little while longer. As Mr. Nagel continued to try to convince his sister to get in the car, he noticed that the dark SUV pulled up a car length or two, or two to the right side of the house so that it was about 20 to 25 feet ahead. After speaking with his sister for another five minutes or so, he again noticed the SUV pull forward another car length or two in the same direction it was facing. Mr. Nagel testified that the SUV was never in park because he specifically recalls that the brake lights were activated the entire time. Eventually unable to convince his sister to get in, to get in the car and leave the party, he and his friends left. As they pulled up past the SUV, Mr. Nagel, who was seated in the front passenger seat of his friend's Ford F-150, observed a woman matching Ms. Reed's description seating in the, se seated in the passenger seat of the vehicle with the interior lights on of her car and her hands attended to. Mr. Nagel testified that he did not see a passenger inside the vehicle or anywhere else in the surrounding area of the vehicle. He further testified that he did not observe any damage to the vehicle and testified that the car tail lights were intact and undamaged. So the crack must have happened after this 1215 because her tail lights are normal at this point, no damage. And he saw them lit up the whole time. He's sure about that. At least six individuals claimed to have left the Albert residence in the morning of, tw of January 29th, 2022, after Ms. Reed had left the Fairview residence and returned home. Jennifer McCabe and Matt McCabe testified that they drove Julie Nagel and an unnamed female home. We now know that that is Sarah Levinson at 1.30 a.m. So she, she needed a ride home from her brother. Then she tried to get her brother to come to the party. 
And then she told her brother, no, I'm just going to stay here to, um, I'm going to stay the night. And then she gets dropped off a half hour later. Does that make any sense to you? Brian Higgins testified that he went to complete administrative work at the Canton Police Department around 1.30. Okay. Sorry. So Brian Higgins had been, Brian Higgins and Brian Albert were both at a funeral in, I think it was in New York for another officer that they knew. And they were coming home from that funeral. And immediately when they arrived back in town, they went straight to the bar to meet up with this group of people. So Brian Higgins and Brian Albert came a little bit later, they might have, they were definitely there after John O'Keefe was with the group, but I don't know if Karen had arrived yet or not, but they were definitely there like the later end of the night at the bars. And they had been drinking probably (laughs) at the funeral. Who knows? So who knows how long they've been drinking? They've been drinking now for a while because they have been at the bars since like 7.30. This all started. Um, so, well, he came in a little bit later, but still, now it's one thirty in the morning and you go into administrative work after you've been drinking all day. Doesn't make any sense. And Colin Albert returned to his parents' home, Chris and Julie Albert's residence, at approximately 12.30 a.m. None of these individuals testified that they saw Mr. O'Keefe's body sprawled in the front yard mere feet from the very roadway all of them would have driven on. Phone records admitted to the grand jury from the night in question established that Ms. Reed made numerous calls to Mr. O'Keefe in the early morning of January 29, 2022, which were never answered. Third-party witnesses testified it would have made, it would have been completely out of character for Mr. O'Keefe to leave his two adopted children home alone, unattended overnight. Jennifer McCabe, Brian Albert's sister-in-law, so Jennifer McCabe is married to Brian Albert's wife Nicole and Carrie Roberts testified that they received early morning calls from Ms. Reed asking if they could go help locate O'Keefe because he never came home. Ms. Reed subsequently drove to pick up Ms. McCabe across town to go look for Ms. McCabe. Uh, for Mr. O'Keefe. Ms. McCabe then drove Ms. Reed's car to Mr. O'Keefe's residence where they met Carrie Roberts. So, um, Karen Reed met up with Jen McCabe. She was very frantic and um, obviously, you know, stressed and upset. And so Jen McCabe offered to, to do the driving to, you know, take her home, whatever. So Jen McCabe drove Karen's car home back to John, John O'Keefe's house. And Karen, I'm sorry, Carrie Roberts met them there. And then they all got into Carrie Roberts car and, After that, they all went um, in Carrie Roberts' car looking for John. Uh, But before that, McCabe then drove Ms. Reed's car to Mr. O'Keefe's residence, where they met Carrie Roberts after the women conducted a final check to ensure that he had not returned home. They drove together in Ms. Reed's car back to the Albert residence to see if O'Keefe might be there. And it is very, very, very plausible that all of this happening right here was maybe um, conducted or shaped so that it would uh, add more time to them getting the body out and making sure that John was really deceased. In my opinion, I think this could have been some delay tactics. All right, so as they pulled up to Brian Brian Albert's house at 6.04, a.m. Ms. Reed spotted an unconscious Mr. O'Keefe lying face up on his back in the front yard of the Albert residence. While Ms. Reed and Ms. Roberts attempted to render aid, Ms. McCabe called 911. Law enforcement officers from the Canton Police Department responded to the scene. Mr. O'Keefe was subsequently transported by EMTs to Good Samaritan Hospital, where tragically he was pronounced unalive. 
at the, at 7.59, the recovery of evidence from the crime scene was presented to the grand jury as follows. Sergeant Michael Link testified that the Canton Police Department recovered the following evidence from the crime scene on the morning of January 29, 2022. One, a clear broken drinking glass, and two, six frozen BLOOD drops, which they placed in red solo cups that were provided by a neighbor. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that's not standard procedure. I don't think you collect evidence with red solo cups normally, um, unless you're living in Canton and uh, Norfolk County and <laughs> corrupt corruption ensues everywhere. There's so the members of the Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team, or the CERT team, conducted a subsequent search of the Albert residence on January 9th, 2022 at approximately 6 p.m., so 12 hours later from when he was found. This time, recovering three pieces of red and clear plastic consistent with Ms. Reed's taillight. Additionally, according to Detective Sergeant Michael Link's testimony before the grand jury one week later, on February 4th, Chief Berkowitz of the Canton Police Department reportedly drove by the Robert, Albert residence on a whim and just happened to see from his moving vehicle an additional piece of red plastic that was consistent with the taillight of Ms. Reed's vehicle. So for some reason, the chief of police decided to insert himself in this case. Don't know why, but he's there. Maybe it was blackmail. I don't know. <laughs> when an incredulous grand juror specifically inquired as to why the chief of police had responded to the Albert residence and how he discovered the evidence, Detective Link explained nobody called the chief. So the chief just went there on his own and found it. A week later, when pressed further by the juror as to why he just wandered over there, did, did, pff, why am I stuttering? Detective <laughs> Sergeant Link recounted through hearsay he was driving down Fairview Road and he sought the evidence. All right, so the argument. The grand jury serves a vital purpose in our, just, in our system of criminal justice by standing between the government and the individual as to any charge that is punishable by imprisonment in state prison. There are two circumstances where judicial inquiry into the quality of evidence heard by the grand jury is unwarranted. One, when it is unclear that insufficient evidence was presented to the grand jury to support a finding of probable cause. And two, when the defendant contends that the integrity of the grand jury proceedings has been impaired. As long as held as long held by the supreme judicial court in commonwealth versus odell when the integrity of the grand jury proceedings is impaired by an unfair and misleading presentation by the commonwealth the indictment must not be allowed to stand indeed an indictment must be dismissed based on impairment of the grand jury when the following three elements are met number one Law enforcement knowingly or recklessly presented false or deceptive evidence to the grand jury. I'd say so. Number two, the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. Yes. And three, the evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. I would say that all three of those are met in the Karen Reed case. For example, in the seminal case of Odell, a police detective testified before the grand jury in support of an indictment against a defendant for armed robbery. Uh, during the course of the detective's testimony, the detective relayed to the grand jury a portion of the statement made to him by the defendant admitting that he was in the van with his co-defendant just prior to the armed robbery and that he waited in the van for his co-defendant on the side street outside the store where the armed robbery took place. Significantly, however, the detective failed to testify regarding an exculpatory portion of the defendant's statement in which the defendant claimed 
he had no knowledge that his co-defendant was going to commit an armed robbery when he entered the store. The court held that the presentation of the defendant's edited statement tended to distort the meaning of that portion of the defendant's statement, which was repeated to the grand jury and strongly suggested incorrectly an admission of guilt by silence. On that basis, the Supreme Judicial Court held that the integrity of the grand jury proceedings was impaired and dismissed the indictment against the defendant for armed robbery. Thus, in Odell, the Supreme Judicial Court held that where the withholding of exculpatory evidence from the grand jury impairs the integrity of the grand jury proceeding, the indictment must be dismissed. In keeping with that precept, courts have similarly found the law that law enforcement may not withhold known exculpatory information which could in undermine the credibility of an important witness in the eyes of the grand jury and consequently affect their decision to indict. A. The Commonwealth and its agents knowingly and recklessly presented false and deceptive evidence to the grand jury and withheld known exculpatory information for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. As set forth herein, throughout the Commonwealth's presentation of evidence to the grand jury, the Commonwealth repeatedly elicited false and deceptive evidence and withheld exculpatory information, which was known to the Commonwealth and its agents at the time of the grand jury proceedings and distorted the facts presented to the grand jury for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. On the Supreme Judicial Court, as the, sorry, as the Supreme Judicial Court has made clear, there can be no doubt that the knowing use by the Commonwealth or use of its agents of false testimony to procure an indictment is a ground for dismissing the indictment. So, basically, you should absolutely dismiss the indictment if <laughs> there is false testimony that is being given to procure that indictment, which I think they have met in this case. Number one, the Commonwealth intentionally admitted false and deceptive statements to the grand jury regarding purported admissions made by Ms. Reed at the crime scene. Detective Sergeant Michael Link testified at the grand jury that he observed, oversees the Canton Police Department's Detective Bureau and was one of the first investigating officers to arrive at the crime scene just after 6 a.m. on the morning of the 29th. Here, like in Odell, the Commonwealth intentionally elicited testimony from Detective Sergeant Link regarding an, an incomplete and misleading statement that he attributed to Ms. Reed based not on his own personal knowledge or observations, but instead based on purported conversations he had with unidentified officers that arrived on scene before him. Specifically, Sergeant Link tested, testified before the grand jury as follows. So officers that were there prior to my arrival had attempted to speak with Karen Reed, but from what I had gathered from them, she was too hysterical and was unable to really assist in any way. The only information they were able to retrieve from her is that she could not recall whether or not she had been there to Fairview Road. Here, like in Odell, this portion of Ms. Oh, Ms. Reed's purported statement taken out of context seems incredibly inculpatory because evidence presented to the grand jury unequivocally established that Ms. Reed dropped O'Keefe off at the Albert residence just after midnight on January 29th. However, Sergeant Link's recitation of this rank, inadmissible and unreliable double hearsay is incomplete, inaccurate, and intentionally deceptive. According to the January 29th Canton Police Department incident report, Ms. Reed spoke to three responding officers at 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, all of whom arrived on scene before Sergeant Link. One, Officer Seraf, two, Officer Mullaney, and three, Sergeant Good. The, the Commonwealth and Sergeant Link have been in possession of this report since the case's inception, according to Officer Seraf's portion of the report memorializing his conversations with Ms. Reed on January 29th, Ms. Reed was severely distraught and unable to tell him what happened and kept screaming, is he dead? 
Reed was hysterical and distraught and repeatedly screamed, is he dead? And that's my boyfriend. Notably, officers Seraph and Mullaney never attributed any incriminating statements or admissions to Ms. Reed as Sergeant Link falsely recounted to the grand jury. It's pretty, pretty telling. Instead, Detective Sergeant Link appears to have adopted and regurgitated an incomplete and deceptively inculpatory version of Sergeant Good's purported conversation with Ms. Reed at the crime scene to the grand jury. According to Sergeant Good's report memorializing his conversation with Ms. Reed on January 29th, Ms. Reed was hysterical and was repeatedly yelling, is he dead? When Sergeant Good asked Karen how O'Keefe ended up there, i.e. on the lawn, she replied, I don't know. Sergeant Good then asked her if she drove to the Albert residence the night prior, to which she responded, I think so. He, she's in shock at this point. So, yeah, she's just, she's just had to perform CPR on her boyfriend, who she was looking for at 6 in the morning, she finds, unconscious. Uh, so she says, I think so, and asked if she had driven there the night before. He noted that Ms. Reed appeared visibly upset and unable to keep her train of thought and told him that she couldn't remember at what point Sergeant Good stopped asking her questions. Thus, Sergeant Link's testimony to the grand jury that the only information the responding officers were able to obtain from Ms. Reed was an admission that she couldn't remember whether she had been there or not is false, incomplete, and deceptive. We have a uh, recognized possible impairment if a prosecutor were to deceive grand jurors by presenting remote hearsay in the guise of great of direct testimony, which is what they just did. Indeed, here, like in Odell, Sergeant Link's testimony to the grand jury distorted Ms. Reed's statements to responding officers and strongly suggested incorrectly an admission of guilt that she couldn't remember driving to 34 Fairview Road. In actuality, however, reports in the possession of the Commonwealth suggest that Ms. Reed told law enforcement that she thought she drove O'Keefe to the Albert residence and indicated that she appeared visibly distracted and unable to keep her train of thought when the responding officer asked her additional questions, including when she made the statement to the effect of, I don't remember. Thus, Rather than ensure the rest of Ms. Reed's statement was admitted into evidence, the Commonwealth allowed Detective Sergeant Link's false and misleading recitation of Ms. Reed's statement to responding officers remain unimpeached for the purpose of unfairly implicating Ms. Reed and ensuring an indictment. Wow. All right. And we're just getting started here, guys. <laughs> Number two, Detective Sergeant Link's intentional deception regarding his long-standing relationship with the Albert family and his history of deputizing himself to investigate crimes involving the Alberts. Additionally, Detective Sergeant Link, i.e. an agent of the Commonwealth, utterly failed to disclose to the grand jury exculpatory information which undermines his incredibility in the case, in this case, as well as public confidence in the fairness and impartiality of this investigation. Indeed, publicly available federal court documents confirm that one, Sergeant Link is a longtime childhood friend and drinking buddy of the percipient witnesses in this case. This is crazy. And two, Sergeant Link has a documented history of deputizing himself to investigate crimes perpetrated by his long longtime childhood friends, the Alberts, to shield them from criminal liability. For example, on August 2nd, 2007, Sergeant Michael Link was sued in Massachusetts District Court by plaintiffs Mark Lopolito and Alfredo Lopolito, the Lopolitos, for civil rights violations pursuant to 42 U.S.C. 1983, da, 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 in a case involving percipient witness Chris Albert and, oh wait, the other brother, Tim Albert who brother of home a homeowner Brian Albert. So there's Kevin, there's Brian, there's Chris, there's Tim. That's four that I know of. I think there might even be more than that. 
So the facts set forth in the Lapolito's amended complaint are strikingly similar to the facts in this case and allege as follows. On August 31st, 2002, Mark was sitting in a friend's car in a parking lot outside the Golden China restaurant in Canton, Massachusetts at approximately 1245 a.m. So this guy is just sitting in his car. Mark was sitting uh, sitting in a friend's, a friend's car just parked outside a Golden China restaurant, minding his own business. Let's see what happens, shall we? Earlier that evening, Mark had been in a verbal dispute with several individuals, including a man named Chris Albert, or I'm sorry, named Tim Albert. Sorry, my lips are cracked and hurting. Okay, so earlier that evening, Mark had been in a verbal dispute with several individuals, including a man named Tim Albert, the brother of Brian and Chris Albert, both of whom are percipient witnesses who testified before the grand jury in connection with this case, Karen Reed's case. As Mark was sitting in the parking lot, he noticed a group of several men, including Tim Albert and Chris Albert, leave the Centerfields bar in Canton and approach his vehicle. When Mark exited his vehicle, he was attacked and beaten by Chris Albert. After the beating, Mark called his brother Alfredo to let him know what had happened. Shortly after Alfredo arrived at the parking lot to check on his brother, Chris Albert's childhood friend, Detective Sergeant Link, emerged from the Centerfields bar swaying and began yelling that he was a police officer. When two other Canton police officers arrived on scene, Detective Sergeant Link instructed them to handcuff Mark's brother and place him in the police cruiser. Remember, Mark sitting in his car minding his own business. These guys approach him, he comes out of the car, they beat the crap out of him. Okay, moving on. Mark calls his brother Alfredo. Alfredo shows up. They start messing with Alfredo. Um, all right, so let's see. When two other Canton police officers, they want, they instructed them to handcuff Alfredo and place him in the police cruiser. So they wanted Alfredo handcuffed. According to Mark, as the responding officers handcuffed Alfredo and placed him in the vehicle, Detective Sergeant Link pushed Mark backwards, punched him with a closed fist in the face, took him to the ground, and continued striking him, and then bit him on the arm so hard that he broke the skin. This is an officer of the law, currently still a sergeant, a detective sergeant. And when did this happen? Mm, 2002. He is still a detective in the Canton Police our office or department. It's insane to me. All right, so he did all that stuff, according to Mark. Officer Lane, one of the responding officers, had to pull Detective Sergeant Link off of Mark to stop the beating. After doing so, Officer Lane did not ask Lapolito for any identifying information, simply told him to leave unless he wanted to be arrested. So now Officer Lane is using his authority, like, get out of here or you're going to go to prison. Detective Sergeant Link then walked over to the police car where Alfredo was being held and spit in his face. Immediately thereafter, Officer Lane released Alfredo from his handcuffs and told him to get in his car and leave. So Officer Lane obviously was the officer with the common sense here that said Sergeant Link's being out of control and we need to mitigate this and I'm just going to let these people leave. But he didn't, he wasn't nice about it and he was like, get out of here or I'm going to handcuff you, basically. All right, so after releasing Alfredo from handcuffs, he told him to get in his car and leave. On October 31st, 2002, Alfredo went to the Canton Police Station to file a complaint with internal affairs regarding the incident. Alfredo was sent away and told he needed to come back on September 3rd, 2002, if he wanted to make a complaint. So, 
I don't know, whatever, he, it, for whatever reason, come back to our office on the 3rd. We can't do it now. Whatever weird excuse they gave him. So he left. Alfredo was sent away and told to come back on the 3rd if he wanted to make a complaint. On the 3rd, Marco Pito went to the Canton Police Station to make a complaint and describe Sergeant Link's conduct on the night in question. Shortly thereafter, Mark and Alfredo received a summons in the mail to appear in court on September 25th for charges related to assault and battery on a police officer, namely Detective Sergeant Link. Are you freaking kidding me? According to Discovery, produced in that case, no police reports were drafted or filed in connection with the incident until September 2nd, 2002, after Alfredo attempted to initiate a complaint against Detective Sergeant Link. According to the amended complaint, months later, on February 6, 2003, Mark and Alfredo Lupito were inside a mobile gas station in Canton when Detective Sergeant Link entered the store and asked Mark how he was doing. He told Detective Sergeant Link that he wasn't doing well because he was being forced to appear in court even though it was Link who had attacked him. Seconds later, several police cruisers appeared in the parking lot. Detective Sergeant Link placed Mark under arrest for threatening, disorderly conduct, and intimidation. Wow. Lapolito was booked and held at the police station until 3 a.m. the next morning. These police officers are so corrupt. I, something, this needs to stop. I mean, there's so much corruption in, <laughs> in this case. I can't, I can't. All right, so on October 23rd, 2003, after a three-day jury trial, Mark and Alfredo La Lapolito were found not guilty on all charges arising out of the incident. The ADA, who handled the witness intimidation charges arising out of the February 6, 2003 incident, thereafter dismissed the charges after admitting, admittedly realizing Sergeant Link was a liar. The Lapolito's civil case against Detective Sergeant Link ultimately settled out of court. So they sued him, and rightfully so. Significantly, however, during the course of that litigation, Detective Sergeant Link made several admissions in federal court documents which directly bear on his credibility in this case. Number one, he admitted he consumed approximately four to five beers at Centerfield's bar before deputizing himself to investigate a crime involving his longtime friend, Chris Albert. He admitted that his friend Chris Albert approached him with his wife Julie Albert on the night in question and indicated that he had just gotten into a fight with Mark Lapolito. He admitted that he observed Chris Albert's hand to be swollen, and he admitted that he is a longtime childhood friend of Chris Albert. Notwithstanding his close relationship with the witnesses in the case in this case and the fact that he was personally sued for using his position of power to cover up crimes against the Alberts, or involving the Alberts, crimes of the Alberts, Detective Sergeant Link testified in his case as if he was a completely independent neutral investigator with no relation to the Alberts, the very family he was supposed to be investigating. Detective Sergeant Link's decision to withhold this exculpatory information unequivocally distorted the grand jury proceedings in this case. The Commonwealth's failure to disclose this exculpatory information and present the following deceptive facts to the grand jury impaired the integrity of the grand jury proceedings requiring reversal. The Commonwealth never elicited any testimony from Detective Sergeant Link informing the grand jury that the Canton Police Department was conflicted off of this case. Interesting, they somehow avoided that. Detective Sergeant Link testified that he notified a separate investigative agency, the Massachusetts State Police CPAC unit, for some unspecified reason to respond to the crime scene to investigate the case and that Trooper Michael Proctor returned his call. When a member of the grand jury specifically asked what the CPAC unit is and why they were called, Sergeant Link responded, CPAC unit is the state police unit that investigates homicides or unalivings. Anything suspicious, they would respond. 
Thus, Detective Sergeant Link falsely implied to the grand jury that the Canton Police Department lost jurisdiction because the state police always respond to the investigative homicides and withheld the fact that the agency he works for, the Canton Police Department, was conflicted off the case because of the fact that Kevin Albert, a Canton police officer, is the brother of homeowner Brian Albert. In reality, as admitted by Norfolk County District Attorney Morrissey, when the statement served him, the Canton Police Department recognized early on they had a a potential conflict and asked state police to take over the Reed investigation as soon as they realized O'Keefe's body had been found at the home of Brian Albert, whose brother Kevin works for the Canton Police Department. In spite of the Commonwealth's admitted knowledge of this fact, the prosecution never disclosed to the grand jury that the reason the Canton Police Department lost jurisdiction to the case in this case was because of their agency. It was because their agency was conflicted. If Detective Sergeant Link and Trooper Michael Proctor has been honest about their long-standing relationship with the Alberts, the grand jury would have been extraordinarily skeptical of this entire investigation as they should have been, particularly given the fact that given the fact that Detective Sergeant Link and the Canton Police Department remained involved in the case in the hours and days discovering the agency was conflict even after the uh, agency had been conflicted off. They were still inserting themselves. The Canton Police Department is the one that, uh, chief, the Canton Police Chief is the one that went and found that last piece of taillight that was the final missing piece to this case. Canton Police Department Detective Sergeant Link further testified before the grand jury that he was not scheduled to work on January 29th, 2022, but responded to Brian Albert's residence anyway to investigate the unaliving of a Boston police officer who was found severely injured at his residence. Thus, just like in the case involving Chris Albert, off-duty Sergeant Link deputized himself to investigate a crime in which his longtime friend was a witness. Or even a suspect. The Commonwealth further attempted to distort the facts relating to Detective Sergeant Link's decision to involve himself in the In this case, even after Sergeant Link admitted he was not working by stating, but in essence, you're always working, is that not fair to say? To which Sergeant Link responded, yes, sir. In spite of Detective Sergeant Link's clear conflict of interest, he personally took it upon himself to conduct the initial interviews of homeowners Brian and Nicole Albert and personally memorialized the report's regarding their stu- their statements. One of the members of the grand jury, perplexed by Brian and Nicole Albert's decision to walk inside their residence on the morning of January 29th, which, you know, I would I question that too, why they never came out of their house. Uh, specifically, the, so this juror asked specifically, did the owners, occupants of the home, ever appear on the scene and interact with any of the officers? Officer Mullaney responded that only Sergeant Link and Sergeant Good entered the residence to speak with them. So what does that tell you? The juror again said, but they never came out to interact with you while, while, they were, while you were there. To which Officer Mullaney replied, not that I recall, no. Another member of the grand jury, as at the, at the close of Sergeant Link's testimony, asked, So how close to the house to where the body was laying and with the fire department coming down and the lights going, no one from the house heard the noise and came to say what's going on? Quite obviously, the grand jury was disturbed and confused as to why the homeowners sequestered themselves in their residence and hid themselves from the police. It's a good question. A lot of us are asking the same thing. Had they known that the person who took and memorialized their initial statement was a longtime family friend, this inf- information would have seriously undermined the credibility of Brian and Nicole Albert and raised 
further questions of for the grand jury about their involvement in O'Keefe's unaliving. Detective Sergeant Link also testified before the grand jury that he returned to the Albert residence at 9 a.m. after being contacted by Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McKay, because she supposedly had more information that she just wanted to share with him and told him that she forgot to tell responding officers that while she and Karen were driving around looking for the victim, Ms. Reed made a statement saying, I hope I didn't hit him. This is coming from Jump Cape, so we cannot, we cannot trust this. Miss Howells long to die in the cold at 2.27 in the morning. So, yeah. So she said that Karen said, I hope I did not hit him, and that Karen made the statement again at the scene after they had discovered the victim. Significantly, the Commonwealth failed to elicit the fact that Sergeant Link is a personal friend of the Albert family, which includes Jennifer McCabe, and that Detective Sergeant Link and the Canton Police Department were already supposed to have been conflicted off of the case already, making it completely inappropriate for Sergeant Link to conduct any further interviews with his longtime family friends. Thus, the Commonwealth and Detective Sergeant Link intentionally withheld known exculpatory information, namely one that the Canton Police Department was conflicted off the case because numerous individuals at the top of the department were close friends and or family members of the percipient witnesses and potential suspects in the case. Two, that that Detective Sergeant Link is a childhood friend of the Alberts, and three, that that Detective Sergeant Link has a documented history of deputizing himself to investigate crimes perpetrated by his longtime childhood friends, the Alberts, to shield them from criminal liability. Clearly, this information would have caused the grand jury to question the independence and neutrality of the instant investigation and would have and would have undermined the credibility of Sergeant Link, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, all of whom testified before the grand jury. The reason the Commonwealth withheld this exculpatory information is simple. This impeachment evidence undermines the prosecution's investigation, is an embarrassment to the Commonwealth and law enforcement, and weakens the case against Ms. Reed. Thus, Commonwealth and its agents intentionally withheld this exculpatory information from the grand jury to prevent them from asking any additional questions about the nature of the conflict and relationships between the parties, instead ensuring that they indicted Ms. Reed. Three, Trooper Proctor's numerous false and deceptive statements to the grand jury made for the purpose of securing an indictment. Furthermore, the Commonwealth and its agents knowingly withheld from the grand jury the fact that Trooper Proctor, the Massachusetts State Police detective called in by Detective Sergeant Link to cure the conflict and take over the investigation in this case, is also close family friends with the Alberts. This fact unquestionably deter- undermines the neutrality and fairness of the investigation itself, Trooper Proctor's credibility, and the credibility of the other percipient witnesses that testified before the grand jury in this case. Attached here to are numerous yet non-exhaustive examples of Trooper Proctor's long-standing close familiar relationship with the Alberts. One, from left to right, a photograph from Trooper Proctor's mother, Karen Barsemian Proctor, white shirt, third party witness Colin Albert, white shirt, Trooper Proctor's sister, uh, Courtney Proctor, implicated witness Chris Albert at a birthday party dated July 15th, 2016. Two photographs showing Chris Albert's son, Colin Albert, in Trooper Proctor's sister's wedding dated April 21st, 2012. A photograph of Trooper Proctor dancing with implicated witness Colin Albert at his sister's wedding, a photograph of Trooper Proctor seated at the same table as implicated witness Colin Albert, an implicated witness Chris Albert, and implicated witness Julie Albert at his sister's wedding. So all of those individuals are at his sister's wedding. Interesting. But yet he has not no close uh, family ties with them. And a Facebook post by Trooper Proctor's mother, Karen, in which she refers to Chris, Julie, Colin as her second family. In spite of the overwhelming evidence of Trooper Proctor's long-standing close familiar relationship with the percipient witnesses in this case, which obviously predates his testimony before the grand jury, Trooper Proctor 
intentionally deceived the grand jury by pretending to be a, a neutral detective tasked with investigating a homicide. Agreed. You definitely are misleading on purpose a grand jury by not stating the closeness of relationship that you have with the person that you just are investigating. So as the lead investigator assigned to this case, Trooper Proctor testified extensively before the grand jury regarding his interviews with witnesses, the seizure of evidence and observations relating to the case, yet not once in Trooper Proctor's hundreds of pages of testimony before the grand jury did Trooper Proctor ever disclose his long-standing relationship with the very same witnesses that he personally interviewed in connection with his case before he took the stand. Instead, the Commonwealth and its agents intentionally misled the jury to, uh, by having Trooper Buchanan read his report memorializing Trooper Proctor's interview of Chris and Julie on February 10th, citing following formal introductions. And I pointed that, I noticed that before we, this was even in filing, I noticed that in like one of my first episodes that the, um, the police report actually says following formal introductions even though you already know these people so it was um it's very telling that they really tried tried to hide their family relationships so following formal introductions julie albert provided her cell phone number and chris albert stated his cell phone number that's the the text the quote from uh I think it's from Trooper Buchanan's report, but he would have known, and we find out that he did know that Chris, I'm sorry, that, um, what was I saying? He would know Trooper, Trooper Buchanan knew that Trooper Proctor was friends with this family. So he would not need to write following formal introductions because he would have, already known that they were friends or family. Uh, so thus, Trooper Buchanan falsely suggested to the grand jury that he and Trooper Proctor formally introduced themselves to Chris and Julie Albert, individuals that Trooper Proctor had known for at least a decade and that he literally sat next to at his sister's wedding, as evidenced in the attached photographs. That suggestion was a lie. Unsurprisingly, because of Trooper Proctor's personal bias and long-standing relationship with the Alberts, Trooper Proctor consistently testified before the grand jury in a manner that distorted the facts to the grand jury in what can only be described as a concerted effort to shield his longtime friends from criminal liability and ensure the grand jury indicted Ms. Reed, for example. At the grand jury, Trooper Proctor testified extensively regarding ring video surveillance obtained in connection with the case. Trooper Proctor testified that he was able to personally access the ring application on, on John O'Keefe's cell phone, which stored motion-activated video surveillance footage capturing O'Keefe's driveway on the 29th. The Commonwealth has been in possession of this video surveillance, surveillance footage since January 29th, 2022, and has had ample opportunity to review the footage. Ring video surveillance from January 29th at 5.07 a.m. captured Ms. Reed leaving O'Keefe's residence in her vehicle to look for O'Keefe. During the grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth asked Trooper Proctor to testify regarding his observations of the 5.07 a.m. video, to which he replied, you'll see Karen Reed reversing out of the garage in her black Lexus SUV and she pulls forward I'll play it and then rewind it but you'll notice the right tail light is broken as you can see right here indicating the tail the left tail light is all all red and the right one here is a clear piece showing it appeared to be a gap in the all red lighting on the right side there however what the Commonwealth and Trooper Proctor intentionally failed to inform the grand jury is that a close review of the same video surveillance footage mere seconds earlier shows that Ms. Reed's, uh, the Ms. Reed backs her Lexus SUV out of the driveway in the snow. Her passenger rear taillight strikes O'Keefe's parked 
Chevy Traverse with enough force to cause the wheel bed of the Traverse to jostle. It is unmistakable. You can see the car move. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally mischaracterized and obfuscated, I can't say the word, obfuscated, the extraordinary exculpatory portion of the video, which provides an alternate explanation for her broken taillight, i.e. that she broke her taillight when she backed into O'Keefe's Chevy Traverse, not O'Keefe. Later on in Trooper Proctor's testimony, when the video surveillance was no longer on display to the grand jury, ADA Lolly asked an intentionally confusing leading question to further perpetrate the false and deceptive narrative that Ms. Reed never actually hit O'Keefe's O'Keefe's Chevy Traverse. Question, how would you describe sort of how close Ms. Reed's vehicle gets to Mr. O'Keefe's Traverse during the course of backing out of the garage? Answer, watching the video, it is extremely close to, close to Mr. O'Keefe's SUV. In doing so, the Commonwealth and its agents purposefully misled the grand jury into believing that Ms. Reed's vehicle only came close to striking the Chevy Traverse and that, therefore, she must have broken her taillight by striking O'Keefe. Later, in yet another reckless attempt to deceive the jury, Assistant District Attorney Lolly asked Trooper Proctor to testify regarding the cause of death listed on the decedent John O'Keefe's death certificate. At the Commonwealth's direction, the Trooper, Trooper Proctor read into the record blunt impact injuries of head and hypothermia, suggesting that the cause of death was generally consistent with the Commonwealth's theory of the case. Yet, in spite of the fact that the Commonwealth knew full well that Mr. O'Keefe's death certificate also states the manner of death could not be determined, Trooper Proctor was never asked to testify regarding that portion of the death certificate. Here, like in Odell, the reason the Commonwealth wanted Trooper Proctor to read only a portion of the death certificate is because the medical examiner's inability to determine the manner of death is clearly exculpatory and would have undermined the Commonwealth's ability to secure an indictment in the case. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally perpetrated a fraud on the grand jury for the purpose of securing an indictment by repeatedly eliciting only exculpatory information from Trooper Proctor, while at the same time excluding and withholding information from the grand jury that would have been exculpatory on the very same subject requiring dismissal of the indictments. 4. The Commonwealth intentionally failed to elicit Chris Albert's inconsistent statement regarding whether he went to his brother's house at 34 Fairview Road on the night in question. So we still don't know. (laughs) I mean, was Chris Albert there or not? And it's never really been answered or addressed. So we know Julie wanted to go home because she had a migraine. So Julie went home. But did Chris Albert go with her? Or did Chris Albert go back to the Albert residence because he wanted to drink too and party on and have fights? I don't know. So during the course of the grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth allowed Chris Albert to testify that he left the waterfall on January 29th, walked home, and never went to his brother's house located at 34 Fairview Road for the after party. So we're supposed to believe that Chris just walked home from the bar and uh, never went to his brother's house. It's also very cold that night and snowing. So I don't know about walking home from the bar. It depends where he lives, but I don't think he's that close. So his wife, Julie Albert, similar similarly denied going to her brother-in-law's house after the waterfall and testified that she went home to go to sleep. And then in other reports, it said she had a migraine or whatever. So I don't know. However, according to Sergeant Yuri Buchanek interview of Julie and Chris Albert on February 10th, Julie and, Bo- and Chris Albert both indicated they were present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill the night of January 28th and then followed to Brian Albert's home in the early morning hours of January 29th. Oh, <laughs> Okay. So there's the huge inconsistency there. The February 21st, 2022 report regarding interviews. Okay. Uh, The Commonwealth knowingly and recklessly failed to elicit the inconsistent statements made by Chris and Julie Albert during their interview with Sergeant Buchanan 
on February 10th and instead allowed them to testify unimpeached that they never went to the crime scene on the night in question. In case there was any question as to what information ADA Lolly did not want the grand jury to hear during the course of the grand jury proceedings, ADA Lolly explicitly instructed Sergeant Buchanan to read the entirety of his report memorializing his February 10th conversation with Julie and Chris Albert, starting with paragraph 2. At ADA Lolly's direction, Trooper Buchanan then proceeded to read the entirety of his three-page report memorializing his conversation with Chris and Julie Albert, which included numerous inadmissible prior consistent statements regarding their observations on January 28th and 29th, in spite of the fact that both witnesses had already testified. So how was he able to do that? You're not supposed to read your reports. You're not even supposed to like read them out loud, usually. Sometimes maybe you can like reference it, but I mean, you're not supposed to read them. Shockingly, the portion of the report ADA Lally instructed Sergeant Buchanan not to read was the first paragraph of the report, which unequivocally states both Julie and Chris were present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill the night of January 28th and then followed to Brian Albert's home in the early morning of the 29th. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally prevented the grand jury from hearing evidence establishing Chris and Julie Albert as liars. <laughs> they, they lied. They lied about going to Brian Albert's house on the night in question. Like in Odell, this is yet another example of the Commonwealth intentionally misleading the grand jury by eliciting com- incomplete and misleading statements from witnesses for the purpose of obtaining an indictment against Ms. Reed. All right, so... Commonwealth intentionally failed to impeach Julie Albert with an express admission to law enforcement that she knew O'Keefe was not alive before his body was supposedly found by her sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. So the Commonwealth also allowed Julie Albert to perjure herself before the grand jury by failing to impeach her false testimony with an express admission to law enforcement that she knew John O'Keefe was not alive before his body was supposedly found by Ms. Reed and her sister-in-law. Her own sister-in-law. Yeah, Julie Albert. Her sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. On April 28th, 2022, the Commonwealth called Julie Albert to testify extensively before the grand jury regarding her relationship with Ms. Reed and O'Keefe her interactions with the parties at the Waterfall Bar and on the 28th and her recollection of the events that transpired on the 29th. Significantly, Julie Albert's testimony before the grand jury regarding the timing of when she first learned about O'Keefe's unaliving differed remarked, markedly from her prior statements to law enforcement, which were incredibly exculpatory for Ms. Reed and implicated Julie Albert and Julie Jennifer McCabe in O'Keefe's unaliving julie albert testified before the grand jury regarding her recollection of what transpired on the morning of the 29th as follows answer i just woke up and the first thing i do in the morning is like we all probably do is check our phones and i woke up to a missed call from my sister-in-law jennifer mccabe i think it was about 5 50 and i immediately looked and i kind of it was weird because my phone is always on the ringer is always on but the text is always shut off at night so my kids know if you need me call my cell don't text my phone and I kind of looked she called I thought it was just whatever I didn't think obviously anything bad I just thought maybe she did a butt rolled over her (laughs) how many butt dials does the commonwealth think happen nowadays because most people don't butt dial anybody anymore but that being said all right so or she rolled over on her phone. You know, something happened. So I got up that day, was my nephew's birthday, headed over to Brian and Nicole Albert's house, and my brother-in-law opened the door, and that's when they said that, you know, there had been an accident of some sort. And that is a quote from Julie Albert. However, according to Trooper, Pro- uh, Trooper Buchanan's report memorializing his February 10th interview with Julie Albert, she told law enforcement that she was asleep at 4.45 a.m. on January 29th when her phone woke her up 
and it was Jen's missed call, and that is how she found out about John's life being lost. Um, she's definitely lying, because all of these are inconsistent stories with one another, so she's not telling us the full truth. Thus, Julie Albert admitted to law enforcement that she knew John had been had lost his life an hour before anyone actually found his body and had reason to suspect John was injured. Julie Albert's prior admission to law enforcement is incredibly exculpatory for Ms. Reed and suggests that Jennifer McCabe and Julie Albert knew O'Keefe was unalive before his body was supposedly discovered by Jennifer McCabe later that morning. Thus, the evidence inculpates Julie Albert and exculpates Ms. Reed. The Commonwealth was well aware that Julie Albert's testimony to the grand jury was completely inconsistent with her statements to Trooper Rekenick, yet the Commonwealth allowed her perjured testimony to remain unimpeached before the grand jury. Indeed, it wasn't until May 18th a month after Julie Albert testified that the Commonwealth finally admitted or finally attempted to sneak in Julie Albert's prior inconsistent statement by asking Trooper Buchanan to read three pages of his report, memorializing his February 10th interview with Julie Albert at the Commonwealth's instruction. Trooper Buchanan read his report into the record verbatim, the vast majority of which clearly constituted inadmissible hearsay. As set forth in the grand jury minutes, Trooper Buchanan's recitation of his February 10th interview with Julie Albert spans 90 lines of the transcript, with Julie Albert's extremely exculpatory, inconsistent statement appearing on lines 67 through 70. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally hid Julie Albert's extremely exculpatory, prior inconsistent statement from the grand jury for the purpose of securing an indictment against Ms. Reed. I mean, we're not even done. There's more. <clears throat> There's so much more. So the Commonwealth impaired the integrity of the grand jury by deliberate, deliberately admitting inadmissible evidence for the purpose of prejudicing the grand jury, confusing the issues, and consuming time unnecessarily in order to secure an indictment against Ms. Reed. Commonwealth's deliberate decision to repeatedly elicit inadmissible, prejudicial, and irrelevant prior bad act and character evidence further impaired the integrity of the grand jury proceedings and requires dismissal of the indictments. Indeed, Massachusetts courts have long held that dismissal of the indictments is warranted if the integrity of the grand jury was impaired by a prosecutor's improper conduct in the introduction of certain evidence. It's much like in the seminal Odell case discussed above to demonstrate impairment to the integrity of the grand jury proceedings based on the admission of certain evidence, a defendant must make a sufficient factual showing establishing the three elements articulated in Mayfield. One, in inadmissible evidence was presented knowingly or was recklessly or with reckless disregard for its lack of probative value and prejudicial effect. Two, the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. And three, the improper evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. In determining whether those three elements have been met, the Supreme Judicial Court's decision in Commonwealth v. Brown is instructive. In Brown, the defendant appealed his is his conviction for first degree unaliving on the basis that inter alia, among other things, the lower court improperly denied his motion to dismiss the indictments on the grounds that the grand jury proceedings were impaired by the prosecutor's introduction of prejudicial Department of, Cor of Correction records containing disciplinary re reports of the defendant's disruptive behavior in custody. The Supreme Judicial Court upheld the lower court's decision, finding the defendant satisfied the first two elements required for a dismissal of the indictment under Mayfield, explaining that the DOC disciplinary records, which included descriptions of violent assaults on other inmates, manufacture of weapons, and threats against staff were 
while incarcer incarcerated were admitted by the prosecutor in reckless disregard of their lack of probative value compounded by the potential prejudicial effect and that the records were presented with the intention of obtaining indictments. In finding the prosecutor was reckless in introducing such improper, unfairly prejudicial, and irrelevant evidence to the grand jury in order to obtain an indictment against the defendants uh, for first degree unaliving, the court explained that the prosecutor made no responsible effort to weigh the fairness of offering a set of highly inflammatory records demonstrating prior bad acts, proclivity to violence, and other general bad character of the defendant. As to the third element, however, the Supreme Judicial Court held that the improper evidence did not sufficiently influence the grand jury's decision to indict because, in addition to the strength of the other evidence presented in that case, the prosecutor gave a curative instruction explaining that grand jury should not use the fact that the defendant and his co-defendant have been arrested before in deliberations when the jurors determine whether or not they committed the crime. Thus, the court held that because the instructions were given sufficiently promptly after the evidence was introduced and sufficiently conveyed that the grand juror should not use the prior bad acts to support a finding of probable cause, the prior bad act evidence did not sufficiently influence the grand jury's decision to indict, to require uh, dismissal of the indictments. The Commonwealth's recklessly, the Commonwealth has recklessly introduced inadmissible, improper, unfairly prejudicial, and irrelevant propensity and bad character evidence to the grand jury for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. It just gets wilder and wilder. So the Commonwealth recklessly introduced a significant amount of inadmissible, prejudicial, and irrelevant propensity and bad character evidence for the purpose of obtaining an indictment against Miss Reed based on her general bad character. As the Commonwealth well knows, it is a fundamental rule that the prosecution may not introduce evidence that a, defend that a defendant previously has misbehaved in in What's that word? In <laughs> My brain is not working um, for the purpose, <laughs> indictably or not. So is that indictably? Is that, it is a functional rule that the prosecution may not introduce evidence that a defendant previously has misbehaved, indictably or not, for the purpose of showing his bad character or propensity to commit the crime charged. Okay. So whether you're charged with the crime in the past or not, you still are not to bring in bad, bad character evidence, past evidence. Although this type of evidence is sometimes admissible for other relevant purposes, such as to prove a common scheme, a pattern of operation, absence of accident or mistake, and identity, intent or motive, these exceptions are not without limitation. Similarly, although evidence of a hostile relationship between a defendant and his spouse may be admitted as relevant to a defendant's motive to end the victim, such evidence should not be admitted if it relates to events which occurred at a time too remote from the unaliving. Um, animosity between husband and wife three years before... To, too distinct to be probative of husband's motive. I mean, yeah, so much can happen within three years or two years. Evidence of defendant's husband's adulterous relationship, which terminated seven months before wife's unaliving, not probative of motive to unaliving. Moreover, even when this type of evidence is relevant for some limited purpose, the evidence must be excluded if its probative value is outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice in the, to, the, to the defendant. In deciding whether challenged evidence is more prejudicial than probative, courts should consider the following factors. One, whether the Commonwealth thoughtfully weighed the risks of unfair prejudice, whether the Commonwealth mitigated the prejudicial effect through proper limiting instructions, 
Whether the challenged evidence was cumulative of other admissible evidence, thereby reducing the risk of any prejudicial effect, and for whether the challenged evidence was so similar to the charged offense as to increase the risk of propensity reasoning, reasoning by the, the jury. So here the Commonwealth intentionally elicited an unconscionable amount of testimony regarding a completely irrelevant verbal agreement or argument, sorry, argument between Ms. Reed and a woman named Marietta Sullivan, which occurred in Aruba on December 31st, 2001. For the sole purpose of trying to assassinate Ms. Reed's character in the eyes of the grand jury, although every single witness unequivocally testified that there was no history of violence whatsoever in Ms. Reed and O'Keefe's relationship, the Commonwealth repeatedly elicited inadmissible testimony regarding an incident that occurred in Aruba one month prior, which had no logical relationship to the crime charged. A non-exhaustive recitation of the testimony regarding this irrelevant and inherently prejudicial event is as follows. Number one, during the grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth knowingly chose to put O'Keefe's brother, Paul O'Keefe, on the stand to testify about stories he'd heard from other people about an incident in Aruba. Like, how can you testify about stuff that you weren't even there for? <laughs> that makes no sense. All right, so, so he testified about things that he had heard from other people, which is the definition of hearsay involving Ms. Reed and a woman named Marietta Sullivan. Notably, Massachusetts courts have long held that the admission of hearsay statements for the purpose of showing a hostile relationship between the defendant and the victim is not permissible because it would entirely eviscerate the rule's important purpose of securing the correctness and completeness of testimony through cross-examination. In spite of this bright-line rule, Paul O'Keefe was permitted to testify to gossip he had heard from three separate individuals, including his wife, Erin O'Keefe, Laura Sullivan, and Marietta Sullivan, about the Aruba incident. I heard, I had heard of an incident in Aruba where Karen had got off the elevator and saw my brother hugging Laura Sullivan's younger sister, Etta, who is probably 10 years younger than she is, who my brother has known for a long time. And Karen perceived that they were kissing or making out, which was not accurate because I've actually had conversations with both Laura and Etta after the fact, and they said that wasn't the case at all. Well, how do they know? As <laughs> they're also not witnesses to it, so how would they know? And I guess Karen made a big scene, you know, yelled at both of them, and I guess it just wasn't a pretty scene from what I understood. I had originally heard it from my wife who would communicate with Karen often, and then after the fact, through Laura Sullivan and Etta Sullivan. Thus, the Commonwealth invited Paul O'Keefe to testify to his rank hearsay and, and extremely prejudicial propensity evidence for the purpose of obtaining an indictment based on Ms. Reed's general bad character. Two, the Commonwealth also deliberately chose to call Laura Sullivan as a witness before the grand jury to testify about the same incident which, like Paul O'Keefe, she did not personally observe or witness. Inter alia, Laura Sullivan was permitted to testify about her completely irrelevant negative initial impressions of Karen during the planning of the Aruba trip, i.e. that Karen told her she needed her own bathroom and her own space. That her husband told her that she that he saw Karen and John at the pool in Aruba and Karen was giving John an earful because she wanted to get him out of the pool to get ready to go and he just wanted to watch the game, which, in addition to being irrelevant, also constitutes unreliable and inadmissible hearsay. Commonwealth then elicited additional inadmissible and prejudicial hearsay testimony from Laura, allowing her to testify that her sister Marietta told her a story about how Ms. Reed was an asshole in Aruba because she ran into O'Keefe in the hotel lobby on New Year's Eve, where he kind of tripped and like fell and Marietta caught him and Marietta pushed him towards his room. I don't buy that for a friggin' second. And Marietta said at that point, Karen turned around and said, 
who the F is she? And O'Keefe said, that's Etta, Laura's sister. And Karen looks right at my sister and she goes, F you. And my sister was like, well, nice to meet you too. F you too. <laughs> um, Commonwealth then elicited, I mean, that is hearsay. Total hearsay. Commonwealth then elicited inadmissible and prejudicial hearsay testimony from Laura that she spoke with John later that night and he told her that Karen is, quote, crazy. The Commonwealth then elicited inadmissible hearsay testimony from Laura stating that her sister Marietta denied ever kissing O'Keefe and that she would know if her sister was lying improperly vouching for her sister. And finally, after all of that, the Commonwealth then asked Laura to describe whether anything stuck out regarding Karen and John's relationship, permitting Laura to go on a long, irrelevant, and speculative diatribe about her perception of the relationship, which included her opinion that, quote, there was no compassion or affection or anything between the two of them, end quote, and that there was no spark and no connection. I think somebody was jealous and wanted John, and uh, Karen knew exactly what Miss Marietta wanted. Um, or maybe it was Laura. A lot of women wanted John. He was a good-looking bachelor, all intents and purposes, police officer, good guy, took in his kids, you know, um, or took in his sister's kids and raised them as his, as his own. He was catch. He was a really good catch in that area, especially the other people that were in the crowds. Also, you know, people like John, women especially. So, Karen probably did have a, on good authority that there were women who wanted to be with John and were jealous of her. You know that thing as, as you feel it as a woman very often when there's another woman who uh, is in the picture and you feel that tension. All right, so thus the Commonwealth called Laura Sullivan for the wildly inappropriate purpose of spewing inadmissible hearsay and gossip about Ms. Reed's bad character in the hopes that it would prejudice the jury against her for the purpose of securing an indictment. As if the admission of the above evidence wasn't prejudicial enough, the Commonwealth later instructed Trooper Proctor to read another law enforcement officer's report memorializing his February 8th, 2022 interview with Laura Sullivan about the Aruba trip to the grand jury, which in addition to being an inadmissible prior consistent statement also con contains at least four layers of inadmissible hearsay. The Commonwealth then chose to have Marietta Sullivan testify before the grand jury regarding the Aruba trip. Marietta Sullivan testified that she ran into John in the lobby of her hotel in Aruba on New Year's Eve in 2021 when he was super drunk and playfully pushed him towards his room. According to Marietta, Karen appeared, yelled his name loudly, and then told Marietta to go F herself. Inter alia, the Commonwealth also intentionally elicited the following inadmissible prejudicial statements from Marietta. A um, ADA lolly asked Marietta to tell the grand jury what her sister Laura related to her. As far as what John had told her about Karen and John were not at the, at the cabanas, causing her to go on a whole diatribe accusing Ms. Reed of being a liar. ADA Lolly asked Marietta to explain to the grand jury what she and her sister discussed about Karen after the New Year's Eve incident, to which Marietta explained that she told her sister that Karen sucks and she wasn't a fan of hers, and that Karen left a bad taste in her mouth. Well, what do, who, who do we care? So what, Ms. Marietta? We don't give a crap about you. ADA Lolly asked Marietta to testify about Ms. Reed's conversations with her sister about the Aruba incident, which led her to testify that Ms. Reed only apologized to her sister and never apologized to Marietta. Oh, you horrible person. And she never paid for her room either. Marietta further testified that John told her that on January 31st, Karen had apparently been giving him a hard time and had been keeping their distance because John wanted to watch the football game, and apparently that was an issue. All of the testimony constitutes inadmissible propensity evidence and serves no purpose other than to put evidence of Ms. Reed's bad character in front of the grand jury for the purpose of having her indicted 
on these charges. What's more, the Commonwealth subsequently instructed Trooper Proctor to read Lieutenant John Fanning's report memorializing his February 8th, 2022 interview with Marietta Sullivan to the grand jury, yet again reiterating her prejudicial and irrelevant statements above about the Aruba incident. Crazy. Finally, the Commonwealth also elicited testimony from Erin O'Keefe stating that she received a text from Karen on December 31st, 2021, stating she caught John kissing Marietta Sullivan in the hotel lobby. Maybe they really were. I mean, if he was that drunk, maybe Marietta was trying to kiss him. And Karen caught you. And you didn't like that, did you? So you you uh, ratted her out in a grand jury? I don't know. The Commonwealth's intentional admission of this unreliable and prejudicial gossip makes a mockery of the grand jury process. Here, like in Brown, the prosecutor was reckless in introducing the exceptionally cumulative, improper, unfairly prejudicial, and irrelevant bad acts and character evidence to the grand jury in order to obtain an indictment against Ms. Reed. Aside from the fact that the vast majority of the evidence discussed above clearly constituted inadmissible hearsay, the Commonwealth produced no reliable evidence to suggest that the Aruba incidents and anything whatsoever to do with O'Keefe's unaliving a full month later on January 29th or that his, this remote and isolated incident was even a point of contention in Ms. Reed and O'Keefe's relationship after the trip. Indeed, ADA Lolly made no responsible effort whatsoever to weigh the fairness of offering five witnesses, four of whom were not even personally present, to testify about a highly inflammable, inflammatory incident in which Ms. Reed apparently got angry at another woman, not the decedent, because she re- purportedly mistakenly believed that O'Keefe had kissed her. So what? Like, wouldn't you be mad if you saw your man kissing another woman? You'd be mad at that woman. Yeah. And the man too, but I would. I would be mad. The Commonwealth intentionally admitted this pr- prior bad act and character evidence for no reason other than to sully Ms. Reed's character in the hopes that the jury would indict her based on the fact that she was, in Marietta's words, an asshole. Any marginal probative value that Ms. Reed tempor- temporary mistaken belief that O'Keefe kissed another girl might have in terms of evidencing a hostile relationship or intent to unalive was far outweighed by the cumulative prejudicial and inflammatory effect of the evidence to the grand jury. Similarly, in what can only be described as an act of desperation to salvage the weak evidence against Ms. Reed in this case, the Commonwealth repeatedly asked witnesses to testify about whether they had ever observed any arguments between Ms. Reed and O'Keefe, knowing full well that minor run-of-the-mill arguments are not relevant to the proceedings because they are not suggestive of motive or intent to commit an unaliving. For example... During the course of John's sister-in-law's, Erin O'Keefe's testimony, ADA Lolly asked her to describe any arguments Ms. Reed and O'Keefe might have had, even if they were relatively minor. Eventually, Erin O'Keefe responded, My mother-in-law, sometimes he thought she spoils the kids too much. The Commonwealth further elicited testimony from Aaron O'Keefe that on the afternoon of the 28th, Ms. Reed texted her to say that O'Keefe had accused her of spoiling the kids because she took his daughter Kaylee to Dunkin' Donuts. After admitting this irrelevant and prejudicial testimony from Aaron O'Keefe herself, ADA Lolly then intentionally elicited the same cumulative testimony as hearsay from Paul O'Keefe. Answer, John didn't confide in me much or talk about it too much. It's mostly stuff that I've heard through my wife because she was, she had a relationship with Ms. Reed. So obviously John and Paul aren't even like close because John wouldn't, John didn't know anything about what was going on in Paul's life. Like relationship wise with Karen. Question, what are some of the things that you've heard through your wife, Erin? Answer, the typical complaining about, you know, what they would fight about when they did fight, mostly based around buying stuff for the kids, spending too much money on the kids, spoiling the kids. My brother was, wanted them to have more of a humble upbringing as opposed to, you know, having fancy expensive clothes or stuff to that effect. 
The Commonwealth then chose to call law enforcement officer David DeSico to testifying regarding Paul O'Keefe's testimony that there were verbal arguments between Karen and John when alcohol was involved, in spite of Paul previously admitting on the stand that he had never personally witnessed any arguments between them. The Commonwealth similarly elicited irrelevant testimony from O'Keefe's friend, Michael Camerano, that O'Keefe mentioned being annoyed with Karen because she hadn't asked him to help her fix a plumbing issue. She hadn't asked him to help her fix a plumbing issue at her house and because she sometimes spoiled the kids. ADA Lolly then had David DeSico regurgitate to the grand jury the exact same problematic statements made by Michael Camerano by having him read his report memorializing his prior interview with Michael Camerano into the record. Finally, the Commonwealth admitted testimony from Jennifer McCabe, who stated that Karen told her on January 28th that she and John had gotten into a disagreement earlier because she had taken his daughter to Dunkin' Donuts to get an iced coffee before school and John was upset about it. Get over it, John. <laughs> Sorry. You're mad because they got an iced coffee. Like, come on. That's probably something really special that the daughter was like, wow, that's something special Karen does for me. Like, that's really nice. And it's not spoiling them. Get over that. All right. Anyways, the cumulative effect of this prejudicial evidence cannot be under stated. The Commonwealth intentionally called numerous witnesses to repeat the same highly inflammatory stories over and over again until the jury had no choice but to indict based on their general dislike of Miss Reed rather than based on the proper consideration of whether there is probable cause to believe she committed the crimes charged. Clearly, the admission of these minor run-of-the-mill arguments have no bearing on motive or intent to unalive someone and are not suggestive of a hostile relationship but instead <laughs> hazel sorry but instead <laughs> dumb dogs now i lost my spot all right um arguments have no bearing on motive but instead were elicited for the sole purpose of tarnishing Ms. Reed's character. Thus, the Commonwealth recklessly admitted days worth of inadmissible, highly prejudicial testimony with no probative value in an effort to secure an indictment against Ms. Reed. Two, the Commonwealth recklessly introduced inadmissible, improper, and unfairly prejudicial speculation a prejudicial speculation lay an expert opinion testimony to the grand jury for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. As explained below, the Commonwealth recklessly introduced incriminating lay and expert opinion testimony and rank speculation to the grand jury for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. Improper lay witness testimony, Massachusetts Evidence Code Section 701 governs the admission of lay witness testimony pursuant to 701. If the witness is not testifying as an expert, then the witness's testimony is limited to those opinions or inferences that are, one, rationally based on the perception on the perception of the witness. So only things that you observed with your own eyes, ears, cannot um, observe hearsay. So you can't observe what someone else is telling you. So that you cannot do that. All right. It also has to be helpful to the clear understanding, to a helpful to a clear understanding of the witness's testimony or the determination of a fact in issue. And three, not based on scientific, technical or other specialized knowledge within the scope of section 702. As a general rule, a witness is permitted to testify only to facts that the witness has observed and may not give an inference or opinion based upon those facts. Uh, moreover, it is improper to admit evidence that is speculative. The Commonwealth knowingly and intentionally elicited extremely prejudicial and improper lay opinion testimony from MSP Trooper DeSicchio or DeSico 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 regarding a hearsay statement he obtained from Paul O'Keefe on January 30th. ADA Lolly was unequivocally in possession of Trooper DeSico's report when he instructed Trooper DeSico to read the following passage from his report to the grand jury. Paul said he went to the hospital to view John's body and it looked like John had been hit by a car. 
Aside from the fact that this statement is rank hearsay, Paul O'Keefe is not a forensic pathologist and has no education, knowledge, or experience to qualify as an expert in opining on manner of death. In point of fact, even the Commonwealth's own forensic medical examiner refused to go as, so far as to say that O'Keefe's injuries were consistent with being hit by a car, and we now know the FBI has, has unequivocally stated that he was not hit by Karen's car. His injuries are not consistent with being hit with a car. Karen's car, the, the condition of her car, is not consistent with hitting a, a human not, not consistent with a vehicle, vehicular homicide. Um, so the determination of O'Keefe's injuries were consistent. The determination that O'Keefe's injuries were consistent with being hit by a car is not an opinion that can be said to be based upon a lay witness's perceptions. Exactly. Thus, the Commonwealth, so a layperson cannot make that determination. Like, yeah, it looks like he was hit by a car. That doesn't make it fact. That doesn't make you an expert. All right. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally elicited this improper lay opinion testimony to fill gaps in the case that their qualified expert could not. Thus, the admission of this improper opinion evidence at ADA Lolly's direction was improper and was admitted for the sole purpose of prejudicing the jury. Similarly, the Commonwealth used speculative testimony by Jennifer and Matt McCabe to fill other gaping holes in the Commonwealth's case. For example, the Commonwealth improperly allowed Matt McCabe to speculate that the reason Ms. Ms. Reed and O'Keefe never came into the Albert residence that night was because they got into an argument, a baseless assumption that was what that was otherwise completely unsupported by the record. That's where we first got that they were in an argument. Karen's car was out. He says, Karen's car was out there. We just thought it was weird. You know, in hindsight, were they having a disagreement in the car? It wasn't as if they pulled up and I looked outside and the next thing you know, they were gone. They definitely moved the car and for some reason just never came into the house. Additionally, the Commonwealth asked Jennifer McCabe to speculate as to why John's daughter might have described Ms. Reed as acting, quote, crazy on the morning of January 29th. I think she is referring to the crazy, to the crazy as when she first called me, it was Jen, John. So that, so the crazy would be Karen telling me that they got into a fight. He didn't come home. He was at the waterfall. Then her remembering the second story of being at my sister's. Oh, we got to get to Fairview to then, um, redacted, had told me she had changed her story again and said to somebody else that he was unalive and he had got hit by a plow. So those were the things that redacted was referring to when she was saying that Karen was acting crazy. Referring to that morning when she was hysterical, wanting to know where John, where John was. That's what she was talking. That's what the, not the niece was referring to as her being crazy. Thus, the Commonwealth intentionally invited this incredibly inculpatory, improper, speculative testimony to, in clear violation of the dictates in Commonwealth versus Buckman uh, for the purpose of filling missing holes with speculation rather than facts for the purpose of ensuring Ms. Reed was indicted. Improper expert opinion testimony pursuant to the Massachusetts Guide to Evidence, Section 702, a witness who is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may only testify in the form of an opinion if the following four elements are met. One, the expert's scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact at issue. Two, the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data. Three, the testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. And four, the expert has reliably 
applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. Expert opinion testimony must rest on a proper basis or else inadmissible evidence might enter under the guise of expert testimony or expert opinion. Traditional rules governing opinion testimony prohibited a witness from giving an opinion on the ultimate issue in the case to preclude a witness from giving an opinion as to the legal significance of the facts in issue in such a fashion as to evade the province of the jury. The rule has been relaxed in recent years to allow an expert's opinion to touch on ultimate issues as long as the expert does not offer an opinion as to the defendant's guilt or innocence. However, the Supreme Judicial Court has held that the expert's opinion may only touch on ultimate issues with within his or her field of expert, expertise if it will aid the jury in reaching a decision. Moreover, when opinion testimony on the ultimate issue is permitted, the jury must be instructed that the witness's interpretation is not Dispo dispositive of the matter. All right, so here the Commonwealth instructed Trooper Proctor to read into the record multiple reports written by MSP computer forensics expert Trooper Garino, which included Trooper Garino's repeated baseless opinion that O'Keefe was the victim of a motor vehicle homicide. Indeed, as Born out in the following exchange, ADA Lolly explicitly instructed Trooper Proctor to admit the following inadmissible and prejudicial evidence. What is a oh, question? What is it that Trooper Garino does for the State Police Detective Unit at the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office? Answer He's technology, a bit of an expert on cell phones, computers, and infotainment systems. Question Did Trooper Garino write a report in regard to the seizure and attempted examination of the infotainment system if you could read that from that report at this time. Answer. On Saturday, January 29th, Trooper Michael Proctor and Yuri Buchanik of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office responded to the unattended unaliving of John O'Keefe at 34 Fairview Road in Canton. Through my investigation, it was found that O'Keefe was a victim of a motor vehicle homicide. At this time, we were unable to access the data and analyze it. Both systems are secured at the Norfolk District County's office. Okay, so immediately upon investigation of the this incident, he's already determined that it's a motor vehicle homicide. You haven't even had a medical examiner take a look at him, and you've already determined he was a victim of mo motor vehicle homicide. Thus, ADA Lolly knowingly elicited Trooper Garino's completely baseless and unsubstantiated expert opinion that O'Keefe was struck by a motor vehicle in spite of the fact that the basis for his opinion ha was his inability to access or download the vehicle's infotainment system. Then ADA Lolly did it again. Question. Now, in addition to that, did Trooper Garino write a report in regard to a cell phone extraction or, or forensic analysis of the cell phone belonging to Karen Reed? Answer, correct. Question, and if you could read from Trooper Garino's report in regard to that at, the t at this time? Answer, through my investigation, it was found that O'Keefe was a victim of a motor vehicle homicide. Trooper Proctor secured the cell phone, but look, what gives you that idea like it just says through my investigation i determined it was this what made you think that you have access for that trooper proctor secured the cell phone belonging to karen reed who is a suspect in the homicide at this time we are unable to access the data on the infotainment or on the phone but it's secured at norfolk da's office Thus again, ADA Lolly intentionally elicited a hearsay statement with zero probative value. The trooper Garino was unable to analyze Karen Reed's cell phone for the sole purpose of admitting trooper Garino's incredibly prejudicial and improper expert opinion that Mr. O'Keefe was the victim of a vehicular homicide, falsely insinuating to the grand jury that he must have reviewed electronic evidence in this case suggesting O'Keefe was struck by a vehicle. This opinion was unquestionably met to deceive 
the jury into believing the Commonwealth had already conclusively determined that O'Keefe had his life ended by a car, a proposition which is patently incorrect. Then again, ADA Lolly forced that baseless conclusion down the grand jury's throat a third time by having Trooper Proctor read yet another prejudicial report authored by Trooper Garino into the record. Through my investigation, it was found that O'Keefe was the victim of a motor vehicle homicide. While on scene, Trooper Proctor secured O'Keefe's cell phone and brought it to the Norfolk DA's office for forensic analysis. A copy of the cell phone extraction was placed on the server for future reference. Thus, the grand jury was presented with a completely baseless assertion by Trooper Garino under the guide of expert opinion testimony that his analysis of O'Keefe's cell phone established that O'Keefe was struck by a, vo- a motor vehicle. His phone would have nothing to do with that. Trooper Garino's prejudicial and inculpatory expert opinion was not based on any facts or data and was not the product of reliable principles or methods as required by Massachusetts G, whatever, evidence 702. Rather, the Commonwealth intentionally elicited this information to fix a fatal flaw in the prosecution's case, that the manner of death was a vehicular homicide. The Commonwealth intentionally and repeatedly admitted prior consistent statements of the Commonwealth's witnesses for the purpose of strengthening their otherwise weak case and hiding significant impeachment evidence to secure an indictment in this case. We're almost done with this, guys. We're getting there. But this is wild. All right, so the evidence before the grand jury must consist of reasonably trustworthy information sufficient to warrant a reasonable or prudent person in believing that the defendant has committed the offense. As the Commonwealth well knows, prior consistent statements of the witness are not admissible. The only exception to this general rule occurs where a claim is made that the witness's testimony is of recent contri- contrivance, or contrivance of, or is the so if it's like the exact opposite of what they're saying, or if the product of particular inducements or bias, and the prior consistent statement was made before the witness became subject to the bias or pressure that is claimed to have influenced his testimony. Indeed, the use of prior consistent statements to rebut the appearance of contrivance should be allowed only with cautionary instructions so that the probative value for the proper purpose is clear because of the ever-present danger that the jury will, despite instructions, consider the prior consistent statement as evidence of the facts therein asserted. Throughout the months-long grand jury proceedings in this case, the Commonwealth recklessly dispensed with the rules of evidence and admitted all prior consistent statements of the prosecution's witnesses, regardless of the statement's admissibility, which had the intended effort of, one, making it appear as if the evidence against Ms. Reed was stronger than it actually is, and two, deceptively concealing inconsistent statements by simply reading entire police reports into the record, such that the jury wouldn't be alert, alerted to any inconsistencies often weeks after the witness had already testified. The benefit to the Commonwealth of utilizing such witnesses, one who possesses no personal knowledge of facts tending to establish the defendant's guilt and who merely testifies to hearsay suggested by the prosecutors, suggested by the prosecutor produces evidence which appears smooth, well integrated and consistent, making an even weak case, make even making even a weak case appear strong. And second, such reliance also prevents the defendant from utilizing grand jury testimony in cross-examining witnesses who will testify at trial. Neither of these rationales and advances the grand jury's tes- traditional functional function. Blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna start that over again. Neither of these rationales advances the grand jury's traditional function as an effective protection against unfounded criminal prosecutions. Uh, while the law on the Commonwealth is clear that an indictment shall not be dismissed on the grounds that hearsay evidence was presented before the grand jury, 
This court should not hesitate to dismiss an indictment when the integrity of the grand jury proceedings was impaired by an unfair and misleading presentation to the jury. We have recognized possible impairment if a prosecutor were to deceive grand jurors by presenting remote hearsay in the guise of direct testimony. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Here, the Commonwealth repeatedly elicited prior consistent statements of witnesses in an effort to make their case appear stronger by the quantity rather than the quality of the evidence. For example, in spite of the fact that Jennifer McCabe, Carrie Roberts, Matt McCabe, Brian Albert, and Officer Seraf all testified before the grand jury, ADA Lolly insisted on having Trooper Proctor read verbatim his reports, memorializing the entirety of all of those witnesses' prior statements to the grand jury. So he, he read, even though all these people testified, Trooper Proctor read their statements to the, to the jury, which you would not be able to do in a regular trial. Only in grand jury proceedings can you do these illegal things. Thus, throughout the grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth utterly failed to impeach a single witness or ask Trooper Proctor to testify based on his own memory what those witnesses told him about a particular issue in the past. Apparently, Trooper Proctor was afraid of perjuring himself and I, and was not confident that the conversations actually happened as he described in his reports. Hmm, a little shade thrown at Trooper Proctor there. This type of presentation was meant to leave the jurors with the false impression that certain claims were supported by multiple witnesses when in fact these were merely regulation or regurgitations of the same facts through different individuals. The cumulative effect of the Commonwealth's false and deceptive presentation to the jury, omission of exculpatory evidence, and repeated admission of admission of inadmissible, irrelevant, and prejudicial evidence influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. The cumulative effect of the Commonwealth's intentional decision to, one, distort the facts presented to the grand jury by omitting certain exculpatory portions of Ms. Reed's statement to law enforcement on scene, two, allow Canton Police Department Detective Sergeant Link to deceive the jury about his long-standing relationship with the Albert family and history of deputizing himself to investigate their crimes, and three, misleading the grand jury regarding Trooper Proctor's long-standing relationship with the Albert family, who should have been considered suspects in this case. For uh, present, present false and deceptive evidence regarding physical evidence in this case, including the ring video footage obtained from O'Keefe's residence and O'Keefe's injuries. Five, exclude Chris and Julie Albert's prior inconsistent statements, which implicate them in O'Keefe's unaliving and exculpate Ms. Reed. Six, the reckless admission of inadmissible, prejudicial, bad act and bad character propensity evidence. Seven, the reckless introduction of inadmissible, inadmissible, and prejudicial opinion testimony, which inter alia deceptively signaled to the grand jury that O'Keefe was ended by a motor vehicle, and eight, the repeated and reckless admission of prior consistent statements of witnesses in an effort to bolster the credibility of those witnesses, unquestionably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. Here, like in Odell, Detective Sergeant Link's testimony to the grand jury distorting Ms. Reed's statements to responding officers and falsely suggesting an, admiss- an admission of guilt that she could remember that she couldn't remember driving to the home alone requires reversal. So all of that alone requires requires that these charges be dropped. Moreover, the deception perpetrated by Detective Sergeant Link and Truck and Trooper Proctor in their failure to disclose their personal long-standing relationships with the very individuals they were tasked with investigating completely undermines the objectivity and reliability of the Commonwealth's investigation and would have cast doubt on the Commonwealth's investigation as a whole. Had the Commonwealth presented these easily provable and known facts to the grand jury, like that Trooper Proctor and Detective Sergeant Link are both close personal friends with Chris and Julie Albert and that Chris and Julie Albert lied to the grand jury about statements that inculpate them and exculpate Ms. Reed, 
the jury would have had serious doubts as to the reliability of the entirety of the investigation concluded in this case, or conducted in this case. So as the Supreme Judicial Court explained, if the Commonwealth chooses to admit prior bad act or other propensity evidence, limiting instructions are needed to ensure the propensity evidence does not sufficiently influence the grand jury's decision to indict. Here, the Commonwealth never gave a single limiting instruction regarding the limited and proper use of other bad acts evidence as is required under the law. Um, Noting the jury was instructed on limited use of bad act evidence, both when admitted and during final charge and quoting with favored judges instruction to jury that they were not permitted to use the information to infer that if somebody did something in the past, then they must have done it the matter that we're now on trial for. That's never allowed. The prosecutor's failure to give any limiting instruction regarding any of the extensive bad act and character evidence text tactically oh, invited tactically invited the grand jurors to use the bad act evidence for propensity purposes the exact use of such evidence that the supreme judicial court explicitly condemns moreover even if the commonwealth had given a limiting instruction that would not explain why the commonwealth deliberately admitted the prejudicial evidence in the first place instead of Simply omitting it from the grand jury presentation, the answer is clear with or without the limiting instructions. The Commonwealth needed the propensity value of the evidence in order to indict Ms. Reed. Finally, the improper admission of this evidence cannot be saved here by the strength of the other evidence presented to the grand jury. Indeed, the evidence against Ms. Reed was weak, based on deception, and was presented almost entirely through the use of inadmissible evidence. There is no question that the deliberate admission of improper propensity and opinion evidence went a long way to filling gaps and curing deficiencies, all to the defendant's prejudice. The combination of all of this, the false and deceptive testimony presented to the grand jury, the extensive propensity and opinion evidence given to the jury without limiting instructions, and the repeated admission of inadmissible and unreliable hearsay admitted for the sole purpose of bolstering the Commonwealth's otherwise weak case, could not help but influence the grand jurors improperly to indict. This impairment of the integrity of the grand jury was pervasive and serious and requires the dismissal of the indictments of this case. For the foregoing reasons, the defendant requests that the motion be allowed and that all the indictments in this matter be dismissed. Respectfully, Alan Jackson and David Iannetti. That was a long one, but a good one. So we also have some exhibits, which I'm not going to go through. They are redacted. I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of them might be interesting. So I'm going to do my best to go through them more thoroughly and see if there's anything in here that we haven't seen. So like this Canton Police Report, we've already seen police reports, but maybe there's some interesting things in here that we have not seen. So I'm going to go through all the rest of these um, elements. And if there's anything worth noting, I'll bring it up on my channel. But at this point, we've gone through the motion, which was a long one. And um, I swear, I thought there was something here. Oh, yes, this is the other thing that was interesting. Um, This was the maybe I'll do a separate video on this because I don't want to keep going just just to keep going. But this is the documentation, basically, of what happened for that Lapalito case with Michael Link. And I lost it now. There we go. The, Lapoli- the Mark and Alfredo Lapalito brothers who were basically attacked and then had... Um, an officer of the law use his power, his abuse of power to arrest some individuals. So this is just the, um, the complaint 
maybe I'll go over that in another episode. And there might be some other information on these in these pages. So I'll get back to you guys on that if there's anything of note. But for now, you guys have heard the motion. And um, based on what you've read and, and heard so far, what do you guys think? Should the charges have been dismissed? I think so. I think the grand jury had been definitely uh, prejudiced. And I believe they did in on purpose, poten- definitely intentionally to indict Karen because the whole entire family had to be somehow, you know, whatever they were. <laughs> the whole Albert family, the McCabe's, they're all in on it. So I really do think that um, they had to, to protect themselves. They're like, well, it can't be us. So it's got to be somebody else. And Karen was an outsider. So had to be Karen that night. Unfortunately, it just happened to be that she hit John's car on her way out to go look for him at five in the morning, six in the morning, and um, the state used that against her. And it could happen to any one of us, guys. Very, very, very scary. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Please hit that like button on your way out, and I will see you in the next one. Take care. Bye now. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeandcourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.